Good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson. Tonight it was confirmed today, amazingly, that FBI agent Peter Strzok recently was escorted out of FBI headquarters as part, apparently, of an internal review of his conduct there. We'll have much more on that story in a minute, which is developing. But first, with midterm elections approaching, Democrats obviously need an issue to motivate their voters, something that is simple and emotionally resonant. The Russia hoax won't do that. It's fast deflating. Maybe pictures of families being separated on the border will move voters to the polls. It's worth a try anyway. So yes, in case you're wondering, what you're watching on television this week is a political tactic, obviously. But that's not all it is. Something else is going on, something terrifyingly real. Formerly responsible people suddenly sound like extremists, probably because they've become extremists. The left is no longer working to convince those who disagree with their views. They're trying to destroy anyone who stands in their way. And that's not a pose. They clearly mean it. They are deadly sincere. This is total war to them. Just a year ago, for example, public figures didn't throw Nazi comparisons at their political opponents. On those rare occasions when they did, and it happened, the ADL scolded them and they apologized, rightly. It was considered too far. Now, it seems like every time you turn on cable news, there's some Democrat likening somebody he disagrees with to Hitler. Watch. This is the United States of Germ United States of America. It isn't Nazi Germany. Bottom line, Donald Trump increasingly looks like Hitler in Nazi Germany. <laughs> These look like the concentration Dave, camps. It's this is a policy that is inhumane. They are the tactics that have been used through, the, through history by the worst purveyors of pure evil, including slave traders, including Nazis, including terrorists. Well, Nazi references have become so common on the left that apparently there's now a search for even harsher comparisons. Nazis aren't far enough. Listen here as one radio anchor implies that anybody who supports border enforcement is likely giving aid and comfort to pedophiles. Watch. I'm just thinking, Stephanie, in terms of the logistics of taking care of these people. I'm, I'm so worried about how many pedophiles are now signing up to go and work in these places. Well, the anchor who said that, by the way, works for NPR, the official soundtrack of lifestyle liberalism in this country. When Subaru drivers in Cambridge or Marin County want guidance, they go to public radio. One famous liberal certainly feels that way. He was so upset watching the coverage of immigration policy on this show that earlier today he donated two and a half million dollars to NPR. Not that they needed that. Thanks in part to taxpayer subsidies, NPR is already the most overfunded news organization in the world. The rich get richer. Perfect. Notice what liberals aren't doing, what apparently has not occurred to them, no matter how outraged they've become this week. Spend money on American kids, and God knows those kids need it. 13 million American children are now growing up in poverty. Many of them live in conditions worse than the children you're seeing held by ICE. In the liberal-run cities across this country, public schools have collapsed. Learning has largely ceased to exist. Violence is rampant. Most of these kids are growing up in shattered families, of course. Marriage is almost non-existent in many of their neighborhoods. And for that reason, many will go on to prison, where they will likely be separated from their own children. It is a tragedy, and just because it's been going on for decades, and it has, doesn't make it less awful. It's awful. Liberals used to care about these kids, or they said they did anyway, but now they don't. They've abandoned them. The left's immigration policies make the lives of these children, American children, worse. Their schools can't cope with student bodies that don't speak English. No matter how hard they try, they can't. Jobs pay less because the left has imported a new surf class that will work for less than minimum wage. That helps them. It does not help the poor. Nobody in Santa Monica cares at all. But the left still claims they care about kids. For example, newly minted theologians Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi have been telling us that all week, sometimes while quoting the Bible to make that point. And yet the curious factor is these are the very same people who tirelessly promote unrestricted late-term abortion for any reason at all, including sex selection. Not an exaggeration. Look it up. And yet somehow they're for children. Huh. How exactly does that work? Interesting question. We called over to Planned Parenthood today to see if a spokeswoman would come on to explain it to us and speak slowly so we could understand. Unfortunately, they declined to come, but we're going to work on that and bring you the answer when we get it. In the meantime, we're joined tonight by Peter Kersnow. He sits on the U.S. Civil Rights Commission and is a frequent guest on this show. Peter, thanks for joining us tonight. Great to be with you again, Tucker. 
What, what's so striking about this, and I'm not, uh, just for the record, defending this or any other government policy. Yeah. I'm merely fascinated by the focus, the attention, the priority that this has revealed, this story about, about family separation on the border. on the American left. If you're worried about the plight of children, what about the 13 million American children who are living in poverty? Why have liberals given up on them, given up on their schools, given up on their job prospects? That's changed. Um, it's changed and it's been changing for quite some time and I think it's a function of the fact that for a long time, at least with respect to blacks in the inner city, liberals have taken the political clout and importance of blacks for granted to their electoral prospects. Forever, frankly, uh, liberals counted on 90% of the black vote. In fact, if they get less than 90% of the black vote, they can't win. And even when they get 90% of the black vote in three of the last five presidential elections, they haven't won. So they've had to look, look for a new block of voters, and they hope that by currying the favor of uh, immigrants, illegal immigrants coming over, somehow this will also curry the favor of Hispanic voters and they have this new loyal voting block. It's not quite working out that way, but I think that's the impetus behind the attention on this and the abandonment of blacks. Why work for the black vote if you know you're going to get 90 percent of it? And if you look at the policies of Democrats over the last 30, 40 years, it hasn't done anything to improve the lot of blacks. In fact, it's mired blacks in poverty. You look at the crime rates, you look at, as you mentioned, the educational levels, all of their policies have either kept black progress static or there's been a regression. And in my neighborhood, I haven't seen CNN or MSNBC 24-7 as I have with respect to the alleged outrages at the border. And the important thing, the interesting thing here is, ironically, the issue of the day, immigration, if you take a look at the policy prescriptions of the Democrats and the left, those policy prescriptions actually have a linear correlation to many of the maladies and pathologies affecting the black community. 40% of the 18-point decline in the black employment rate over the years is attributable to illegal immigration and the competition that comes therefrom. That has family formation issues because people who aren't married aren't, or people who aren't employed are less likely to get married, also more Much likely less. to be incarcerated. And the, the interesting thing is this, when we're talking about family separation, this year alone, 4,500 black kids will be separated from their families because their mothers are going to be incarcerated. Not for, on average, a few hours, like 30% yep. of the illegal immigrants on the border are being separated. That's not what we're hearing. Of course, we think that's permanent separation. It's usually adjusted within a few hours. In contrast, the black kids are going to be separated from their mothers for several years. They may not know their mothers during their childhood at all, but again, I don't hear public policy being adjusted because of that. I don't hear no. hues and cries from the left on this. Because they don't care. They've got a new family now. Thank you. Peter Krishnow, great to see you. Good to see you again, Tucker. Not even a decade ago, the top Senate Democrat, Chuck Schumer of New York, was speaking very differently on the question of immigration. Here's a flashback. Illegal immigration is wrong, plain and simple. Until the American people are convinced that we will stop future flows of illegal immigration, we will make no progress on dealing with the millions of illegal immigrants who are here now. People who enter the United States without our permission are illegal aliens, and illegal aliens should not be treated the same as people who entered the U.S. legally. Something changed. It wasn't the nature of illegal immigration, which has stayed constant over the years. It was the electoral calculus of those in power, as you know. Chris Hahn is a radio show host. He once worked on Schumer staff, and he joins us tonight. Um, Chris, what is going on with the Nazi references? I thought that there was an agreement that all rational people bought into that this is not Nazi Germany. You may disagree with the policies of the other side, but that you shouldn't compare people to Hitler. And in the last three days, I've seen it over 20 times on television, all of them from the left. When did we decide it was okay to refer to fellow Americans as Nazis? I don't think we've decided that. I think people's yes, passions are inflared right now because we're seeing what's happening at the border. 
and it is very disturbing. Anybody who listened to that ProPublica uh, audio of what's going on with children crying for their mothers has to be ashamed of what's being done by the President of the United States to people seeking a better life for their children. Look, look, I, 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 I get it. I get it. it. I'm, oh, wait, hold on. I, I get it. And there are a lot of things that I'm offended by. The fact that your boss, former boss Chuck Schumer, advocates for third-term abortion for sex selection and defends it, which he does, enrages me. But I'm not That's calling not him true. a Nazi. I'm not. Call, it is true, actually. So, Planned Parenthood has an so, explicit so let me policy just, let me just, let me in favor of you. sex selection and abortion. Let, let me, no, no, no. Let I'm let not calling you a Nazi because I think because that that destroys our public conversation. Yeah. Why? Why would you make excuses for that? Well, let me start by addressing your abortion point. Roe v. Wade took the state out of abortion. It's a woman's choice. And people defend a woman's right to choose and not to have the state dictate them. What's happening at the border right, right. now is being okay. done by the president to a group of people okay, but, in our name. But, but, it's very but you're, you're missing, you're missing my point. Conflated. No, it's, uh, that's, that's actually... You're wrong. Look, I don't want to have an abortion debate with you, but the point, here's how they're well, similar. We disagree. I think that lives are being taken, and I think it's immoral. But I'm not referring to the, the people in favor of that policy it. as Nazis, as Nazis, because I think right. things start to fall apart when you don't control and, your and emotions sufficient to have a real rational conversation. And yes. the left isn't even trying. I and agree. and your, all your little water carriers in the media aren't even trying. And they're nodding in their bovine way. Whoa, it's like the Nazis. What do you think is going to happen if we keep Look, talking like that? Honestly, I, what do you think is going to happen? I, I agree. I agree. But when people start saying people are supporting late term abortions, no, they're not. They're supporting a woman's right to choose. What's happening right now okay. is the United States of America is taking people from their mother's arms. That is wrong. The president alone can fix it. And he should. Does it do, do you ever pause and think, you know, maybe this has happened before, like every single day? Peter Kirstenau in the segment before you pointed out that more than 4,000 African-American women are separated by force from their kids every year by the U.S. government in our name because they go to jail. Right. Just like people, people, people who are facing people felony commit, charges for reentry go to jail. And right, so right. that people doesn't seem to bother felony, the left. Why is that? Felonies, uh, people who commit felonies should go to jail. People who are coming to this country no, and also, seeking asylum should not be separated from their children. No, and crossing no, no. the border if, illegally okay. is a misdemeanor, not a felony. No, no, that's not true. If you cross a second time after true. having been sent out, it is a felony. No, it's a felony, actually. That's true. Well, but okay, look, so here's the point. Let's it, find and I'm not even I, I don't. We're still doing. Okay, okay. you're wrong. Okay. But does it bother you that people busted for misdemeanors before being convicted of anything, they are innocent in the eyes of the law, are separated from their children? It happens all the time. Look, I'm not defending of it. Course. I'm just saying, why the me. selective outrage? You never say word one about it in our name. It's immoral. You're look, a Nazi. No one ever says that about it happening to Americans. I'm not calling anybody a Nazi. I'm not calling anybody Good. a Nazi. What I'm saying is what's happening at the border right. is un-American. It is not who we are, and it needs to be corrected immediately. Right. Let me tell it's you something. Politically speaking, you okay. got you hit the nail on the head. This is a hot political issue, and if it doesn't change well, soon, Yeah, apparently, because whatever buy. it takes, you guys will do. Whatever it takes. It's about power. Well, Chris, oh, thank you. please. It's true. Yeah, yeah. Ryan Patrick is a U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Texas. He's right in the middle of all of this. He handles a large number of border cases, and he joins us tonight for clarity on what's actually happening on the border. You are there. You know. Give us a snapshot of what it looks like through your lens. Well, thank you, Tucker. Um, the Southern District of Texas is really the epicenter of a lot of what is going on. My district includes not only Houston, but Laredo, McAllen, Brownsville, and Corpus Christi. And what we have seen over the last four years is a five-fold increase, up to 75,000 family units crossing the border, and it's mainly concentrated in the McAllen area. And so what the Attorney yeah. General's memo said was to prosecute all cases referred to us by Border Patrol, and that's exactly what we're doing. So from your perspective, and you are one of the keepers of the numbers on this, the incidence of family units, as you put it, trying to cross over illegally has risen dramatically it sounds like it has and for the last about decade um, the attorney general as he said basically a magic wand was waved over people who crossed illegally with children and they for the most part were not referred to for prosecution and to clarify something 
that I believe is being misstated and misinterpreted. The Department of Justice, my office, is not involved at all with people who present themselves at a port of entry at one of the bridges to claim asylum legally. We are getting referrals from Border Patrol and other agencies who catch people who are crossing the border illegally. They can then make their asylum claim or any other claim that they believe they have after their prosecution. But the zero tolerance policy that was rolled out back in April by the Attorney General says that all people are to be treated equal under the law, which is we will take all cases referred to us by Border Patrol uh, where there's probable cause to prosecute them. Ryan, thank you for clarifying that. There's so much noise uh, right now that it's nice to have a sober fact-based conversation. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, it goes without saying, and you know this if you've been paying any attention at all. I hope you've been outside playing instead. But if not, you know the major networks have been leading with this border story, and hysterics have defined the tone. Watch. Children are being separated from their parents, part of the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. The crackdown on illegal immigration has split families and members of the Republican Party. Thousands of children taken from their families and locked behind chain fence walls like cages. It's not like there was another story to cover. Oh, wait, there was. Weirdly, over the weekend, 23 Americans were shot in Trenton, New Jersey. It was one of the biggest mass shootings of the year. Have you heard about it? Probably not until now. And you certainly haven't heard any of the anti-gun rhetoric that was ubiquitous just a few months ago. There haven't been any marches. You haven't seen anyone attack the Second Amendment. How can we go after guns when a single migrant remains unadmitted to the United States. Beverly Hallberg is president of District Media Group, and she joins us tonight. Remember, it's a little weird that you could have a mass shooting in a country where one political party pledged to stop them forever, and they don't even notice. I thought and they I cared more about protecting kids than anything else. How could 23 people get shot in Trenton? Was it because they were mostly poor and black that they didn't notice, or what is the answer? I'm not quite sure. I think they found maybe another story they wanted to follow more, and that's why we're not hearing about it. I'll even bring up another big story. Not sure if you heard about this, but the IG report came out last Thursday about the Clinton probe, and there was bias. We've had hearings this week, but I would encourage even your viewers to take a look at some of the mainstream media Twitter accounts. Those stories are buried, if you can even find them at all. So it seems that there is a story that the left wants to put out there, and don't get me wrong. I think the issue about what's going on on the border does deserve media attention. The the president did change a policy in that he is now following, following the laws that are on the books. But at the same time, there is other news as well, and there is so much devoted to this coverage with also rhetoric that's, I would say, very damaging and leading to a conversation on how to deal with this complex issue. Well, it's hysterical and it's extreme all of a sudden. Look, you may not like the policy. I think that's totally legitimate not to like the policy or any other policy for that matter. But to sit by while someone on your air calls other people Nazis, fellow Americans Nazis, like you're a lunatic if you think that's okay. And, and that's everywhere. Am I, am I misstating this? No, not at all. And, and here's the thing is when you do invoke language like calling someone a Nazi, it doesn't lead to actual conversation on how to solve the issue. And even looking at some No, it leads to of, violence. Exactly. And even looking at some of the issues as far as how they're covered and how much time is devoted, the Media Research Center came out with some interesting data. They take, took a look at ABC and NBC and CBS over the past six days. And there was actually three hours devoted between morning and evening newscasts. But when this was at its height under the president under president obama's administration there was yep. only roughly six minutes of coverage even though the new york times came out with a story saying that children with their parents were stuck in horrific conditions these stories should be covered but why is there an unfairness about it and i think what it leads us to believe is that if you're a network that doesn't like the president this is a story they want to run on that they think they can win on yeah, I mean, because they're hacks and liars is the truth. That's fine. They've long been hacks and liars. It's when they become extremists that starts to freak me out, and it's starting to freak me out now. Uh, Beverly, thank you. Good thank to see you. you. Peter Strzok's lawyer just confirmed that Strzok was escorted out of FBI headquarters today. What was happening inside? We've got some sense, and we'll tell you next. Well, apparently, Peter Strzok somehow is still working at the FBI tonight, collecting a taxpayer-funded paycheck. 
despite being exposed as a political operative who promised his girlfriend that he would stop Donald Trump. And keep in mind, he was at the center of the investigation, both into Hillary and into the current president. But Strzok may not be getting off scot-free. Today, his lawyer confirmed that last week his client was escorted out of the FBI's headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C. as part of an internal probe of his conduct there. Rather brazenly, that attorney then said that Strzok had, quote, played by the rules and respected the process and lamented that he has faced, quote, personal attacks. Hilarious. Byron York writes for the Washington Examiner, has been following this story from day one and joins us tonight. So what exactly is happening here, Byron, do you think? Well, we're not entirely sure. My guess would be it has to do with the finishing of the uh, IG report now out in public. We're all able to see it. And the IG did say that uh, he was investigating five people for uh, bias and uh, certainly struck and Lisa Page and three unnamed FBI employees were those five people. How could this guy still work at the FBI? You know, it's, it's uh, so many people actually want to know that. I mean, there were theories that perhaps it would be better to have him inside the tent than outside the tent as this investigation was going on. Uh, nobody's entirely sure. Now, he was demoted in a really big way uh, in, let's see, July, I believe, of uh, 2017 when the IG went to Robert Mueller and brought these texts to Mueller's attention. He, before that, Strzok had worked and been the central figure in the Trump-Russia investigation from the very beginning in the summer of 2016 all the way to the end of July in the Mueller time in 2017. Huh. So it's not as simple, I guess, as the Attorney General saying you violated the most basic precepts of public trust. You have to leave. I mean, it's possible that there's some further use they might have for him? Well, it's possible, and there are others involved, too. Remember, there is Attorney 2, FBI Attorney 2. Uh, he's the one who said, viva la resistance, uh, talking about his opposition to uh, Trump. Also uh, worried uh, what he could have done differently to make sure that uh, Hillary Clinton did not lose. Uh, and then there are two right. agents referred to FBI agents 1 and 5, uh, all of whom expressed serious anti-Trump animus. So, Byron, just to, I have to ask you a question as someone who's known you for more than 20 years. You've been in Washington a long time. Have you ever seen a moment like this, the, the level of emotional intensity of hysteria, the left calling its opponents Hitler every single day on every single show? Where is this moving exactly? Are, are you referring just to this new uh, p parent separation thing or to the Russia thing or I all am. of it together? I am. No, well, to, to the parent separation story. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I think there are you know, two sides to that story, I, but, but I don't think there, there are two sides to calling somebody Hitler. I mean, it's so over the top, and yet it, that seems kind of normal now for the left in Washington. I've never seen anything like this in my it, whole life. It, it has indeed been. And indeed, uh, a former uh, head of our intelligence services, uh, Michael Hayden, former head of the CIA, actually tweeted out a photo of a concentration camp from World War II and said, uh, well, some other societies separated parents from children as well. Uh, and you're absolutely right. There are a, a lot of this just insane uh, rhetoric going on. It is now shifting, by the way, I think, into an, uh, an actual political discussion. And I think it's actually going to clarify things a little bit because uh, yeah. I think a number of Democrats, there, there are solutions to this problem. Uh, they're not easy, but there are solutions to expedite the uh, judicial hearings of people who have crossed into the United States uh, illegally and to deport more quickly uh, the many, many, many thousands who are not granted, who have the process and are not granted asylum. We'll see if Democrats actually want to accept a solution like that. Yeah, of course they don't. But we'll see. <laughs> Byron York, great All to right. see you. Thank, Thank you, you, Tucker. Well, the former capital of the Confederacy just switched a school's namesake from a Confederate general to Barack Obama. Things are changing. We'll discuss it next. Plus, we'll discuss a strange new political ad out of the state of Minnesota. Here's part of it. Unbelievable. Here in the land of 10,000 lakes, we know how to put out a fire.
Well, the former capital of the Confederacy will no longer have any schools named for Confederate leaders. On Monday night, the Richmond, Virginia School Board voted to rename Jeb Stewart Elementary School after President Barack Obama. The name change will cost that district about $26,000. Jason Nichols is a professor of African American Studies at the University of Maryland, and he joins us tonight. Professor, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you, Tucker, and happy Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth. So you're okay with government institutions naming themselves after living politicians. Obviously, that, that's not a problem for you. So would it be bothersome, from your perspective, if three years from now, a school in Alabama changed its name to Donald Trump Elementary School? Well, Tucker, I, I think that we've had, uh, of all the presidents that we've had and that we name things after, I think Barack Obama is actually one of the least uh, problematic. He didn't enslave anyone. He didn't uh, take, anyone, take any indigenous people's land. Uh, so I think that he's, he's an okay figure to name things after. And if Donald Trump, you know, I, I'm, I have no doubt that he's going to be named it, after but Donald hold on, hold on. Trump. But this is utterly subjective. So you're saying as long as I like the guy, it's no, okay to and, venerate and I never, him. First of all, but wouldn't Tucker, it just be easier? Tucker, I never said that well, I liked Barack be... Obama or I didn't like Barack Obama. No, I was no, just but saying he said he, he was a great a, president. A less, he never did anything wrong. I never. I said that he like, is uh, one of the one of the least problematic presidents that we've named things after. Remember, there are two schools in this country. I think he was the single most destructive president there of my two, lifetime by far. There are two, but, but hold on. Wait, there are two why should we name anything after a living politician? Richard M. Nixon. There are two schools in this country oh, named okay, after Richard but he's M. Nixon. Dead. There's a highway okay, but named after George Wallace, the segregationist in Alabama. I, I so, agree. Uh, also dead. Okay. No, but so you're okay just to make sure we there's have the a, standard a, here. There's that a Clinton it's okay library. to venerate living, which is paid for by the Clinton yeah. Foundation, the Library okay. Foundation, and, and so is Obama's and every living president. Listen, but this is a let, government but, school. But so let's be, let's be honest. Of, this is of, like out of context, Tucker. Let's not take things out of context. Now, now, first of all, the context is. The school is mostly African American. I get it. I get it. I know they don't want a Confederate. They consider him to be. That's he's fine. a transcendent figure in that community, and the city of okay, Richmond but, felt that it was it was but acceptable. Then there's, I'm sure, a school where Trump is a transcendent figure. I mean, like maybe it's better if we just say we don't Trump, uh, venerate living politicians because it's a misuse of their power. But let me ask you this: is sincerely, well, what power I don't know what the does test he have? He's, are he's Jeff, a retired uh, politician. Uh, uh, he, he has no power right now. He's one right of the now. richest people in the world and most power. Yeah, right. In, okay, in the yeah. world? He has no power right now. Right, yeah. Okay, so, so, so let me just ask so, you this. So, Do you uh, think, hold on, Barack wait, does this one actually, of the people in the world? this costs, look, I, I Barack know Obama is a powerful person, and I'm not attacking Obama, I'm just saying the idea that he's powerless is silly. Uh, but does this have any effect okay, on the he's, kids he's who go there? He's not an elected I mean, in every city, in every city okay. around America, especially Tucker. the ones with the worst schools, you see these okay. symbolic debates going on about how we make the kids feel better about themselves, which I'm not against. Okay. But does it have any effect on their lives? Are more kids from a Barack H. Obama elementary going to succeed than did from Jeb Stewart elementary? Honestly. Well, I, I can tell you that I think it's insulting. I know as a parent, it would insult me if my child, and it would certainly give me a certain view of that school system, if my child had to go to a school that was named after some Someone who fought to keep them enslaved. So I, I, I get I, it. I get it. Okay. I, no, no, I'm not, I get it. But will it actually have an effect? Will it make the kids more successful? Will their test scores rise? Will the school become more orderly? Will it make their lives better? Honestly, do you really think that it will? Well, I can we spend so much this. time and money on if, this stuff. If there, if there is a figure that is transcendent, a figure whom they look up to and they can look in the mirror and say, that person looks like my dad or looks like how I will look in the future, I think that it could have a positive effect on the self-esteem of those kids. I hope it does, but we much. both know it doesn't. It won't. Is, it doesn't Self-esteem is matter. something that actually affects learning outcomes. We know that for a fact. That's, that's not true. That's, 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 that's no, actually, we know just the opposite. True. The kids that's, who score the highest on the math achievement test have the lowest self-esteem. The untrue. lowest. The lowest. And the opposite is also true. The kids with the highest self-esteem tend to get the lowest scores. The self-esteem stuff untrue. is total garbage. <laughs> yes, it is. Look it up. Great to see you, Professor. Thank nice you. Nice seeing you, Tucker. Always fun. Thank you. It's been a weird year for politics, so of course we have a wave of incredibly weird new political ads. One candidate just filmed himself in front of a flaming dumpster. Get it? Dumpster fire. Metaphor becomes real. Anyway, he's joining us next. It's bizarre. Oh, dead mothers and dead fathers. 
I'm Pat Davis, and I approve this message. It's incredibly painful. Well, it hasn't been a big year for subtle political ads, and we're still just getting warmed up. Former George W. Bush ethics lawyer Richard Painter is running as a Democrat for the Senate in the state of Minnesota, and he just produced what some are calling a dumpster fire of an ad. Watch this. Some people see a dumpster fire and do nothing but watch the spectacle. Some are too scared to face the danger, or they think it will benefit them if they just let it keep on burning. Others shrug and say, oh, all this talk of a dumpster fire, it's just fake news. There is an inferno raging in Washington. But here in the land of 10,000 lakes, we know how to put out a fire. I am Richard Painter, and I approve of this message. Richard Painter joins us tonight. Richard, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank so, you, Tucker. Here, here you have this metaphor, Trump being a dumpster fire. You often hear liberals say that it's a dumpster fire. But you have a literal dumpster fire in your ad. And because you're running from a state with a lot of water, you put out the fire. How did you come up with that? Well, uh, the dumpster fire in Washington isn't just about uh, Donald Trump, although he certainly contributed a lot to the dumpster fire. Uh, it's been steadily getting worse over the years, and a lot of it has to do with our system of campaign finance uh, and the Supreme Court's refusal to allow Congress to regulate campaign finance in the Citizens United case, the PAC money, the super PAC money, and the dark money organizations. And then you have K Street lobbyists, and on top of right. that, you've got financial conflicts of interest of not only so the So it's president, an inferno, as you serious. said. It's an inferno, right. absolutely. It's an inferno. Inferno. You said that in the ad, and you looked fiercely at the camera as you said that, and some of us were a little taken aback, impressed, a little in awe. What kind of reaction have you received to this ad? Well, a lot of people share my concerns about what's going on in Washington. It is a dumpster fire. We need somebody to put it out. We need a constitutional amendment uh, to uh, repeal the Citizens United case so we can get campaign finance under control. We need to clear out Do you have of any? Well, I, I, I agree with you on that. Do you have any firefighting experience? Well, I have some ethics firefighting experience. I spent two and a half years in the Bush administration as a chief ethics lawyer. I saw a lot of what goes on in Washington, and it goes on in both parties. So I want to emphasize right. this is not a liberal or conservative thing. Uh, this is a concern for all Americans. The corruption in Washington, the K Street lobbyists, you got members of the United States House and Senate own stocks in health care companies and energy companies while they're passing health care legislation. You got the president of the so United States with the Trump organization. It goes on and on. If you came to Washington, and served in the Congress, and you were walking down a street on Capitol Hill, and you saw a dumpster on fire, how would you respond to it? Well, I, I think I'd call the fire department on that one. Oh, come on now. Absolutely. Wait, you come to Washington, you see department. an actual dumpster fire, an actual and you don't respond, fire. and you call the fireman? I think you got to get okay. the fire department over there, because my expertise is dealing with the That's dumpster your campaign fire promise? in politics in Washington, the corruption in Washington, the corruption of Wait our campaign a finance it system. Sounds like you're, well, hold on. It sounds like you're promising to get elected and then have someone else deal with the problems. That's no, not much you of said a advice, campaign uh, pledge, is it? Talking about the dumpster fire in Washington, D.C., Capitol Hill, and in the White House. All right. We need financial I guess conflict I was of interest for a more legislation. Than that, Richard. Right. Absolutely. Right. We need Richard a lot Painter. more. We better get it done. <laughs> Richard Painter went to the same high school. I appreciate that about you. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. The left is now demanding that kindergartners get training against what they're calling toxic masculinity. Obviously, that's insane. Doesn't mean nobody supports it, though. Kathy Rue does. Our liberal Sherpa, she joins us next to explain why it's a good idea.
Well, spending millions of dollars fighting something called toxic masculinity in colleges somehow remarkably hasn't made this country much better. And yet some want to triple down on that idea. At the University of Wisconsin at Madison, one professor said we need specialized training against toxic masculinity beginning as early as kindergarten. Only when six-year-olds are taught about, quote, intersectionality and the complexity of masculinity identities will we be truly free. Do you believe that? Kathy Aru is the founding publisher of Catalina Magazine. Of course, she's our liberal Sherpa, and she joins us tonight. Um, Kathy, yeah. how do you think, if you were to take a five-year-old and talk about the intersectionality of masculine identity, how do you think the five-year-old would respond? I think you would talk to the five-year-old in ways that the five-year-old could understand. So you would talk about courtesy, uh, politeness, um, being equal to others, not being uh, aggressive. Boys will be boys. I mean, we've all heard that. Little boys have heard that. That's not going to fly anymore. Right. The future thinkers, um, leaders of America are going to be in a matriarchal society, not little patriarchs. Um, they're not going to be full of toxic masculinity. It's going to be more of a natural masculinity. So we'll have less crime, less huh. violence. Yeah, it'll be a better place to live if little thinkers of tomorrow will be Should better Should we people. have less... So boys can't be boys, but girls can be girls? Yes, girls can be girls because girls are not the um, the violent ones in our society. I mean, boys huh. grow up to be men and they commit three times more violent crime than women. I mean, it's just a fact. So girls are doing it right. So girls are growing up right. Boys are not. Do you think, and you've lived in this world for a while now, the people who come up with ideas like this are literally the unhappiest people in the world. Wouldn't you Why? say that's true? The fewest healthy relationships, the most damaged relationships with their own fathers. Isn't this an outgrowth of their deep unhappiness as people? Well, there was a woman that wrote against DDT, the, the pesticide that was killing um, insects and pests, but also killing birds Rachel and bees. Rachel Carson, yes. Right. So, I mean, so was she unhappy because she didn't like that birds were no longer singing? Or was she saying that we had all these toxins? Yeah, they were helping the crops, but they were killing nature. So it's the same concept. Let's kill toxic masculinity. Let's kill but this. D DDT, but DDT in our boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. DDT is a man made chemical. Right. Uh, testosterone uh, is naturally occurring. Yes, but so testosterone why shouldn't would it lead be to bad murder because it's because natural. It, it's um, testosterone isn't equal to toxic um, masculinity. That's what we're saying. Let's teach boys to um, not be DDT. Let's make them organic. Let's make them green. Let's take it, make them more positive. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay, it's well, that's concept. insane, but you put a happy face on it, and I appreciate that. Catherine, okay. thank you. Okay, thanks. Well, I think you have to be a fool to tell them that to begin with. I mean, the first question is, what, why are we talking about toxic masculinity exactly? The crime rates in the United States and in North America more broadly have fallen by 50% in the last 25 years. That includes pretty much every category of violent crime. And so the term itself is terribly defined. I, I think it's appalling that faculties of education are pushing this sort of nonsense. And I think that if your kids are exposed to that kind of idiot social justice pseudo-education that you should pull them our identities as masculine and feminine by being expressly taught them by teachers. You know, that almost all that's learned by example, to the degree that it's learned, and a tremendous amount of it is consequence of biological inclination. So the, the notion that you can fight something as ill-defined toxic as toxic masculinity with badly designed educational programs and, uh, and accomplish the end that you desire is it's absolutely hopeless. That will never happen. All it'll do is further so mess up an, an education system that's messed up badly already. I don't want to call you out on live TV, but what you're suggesting is that the genders are biologically fixed. And we know that's not true because no, they're not, they're not Facebook biologically tells us it's fixed. not true. Well, they're not biologically fixed, you know. I mean, people are, uh -huh. are quite plastic, and we, and we learn things all the time. We can modify our behavior. But there are masculine and feminine proclivities. But it isn't even the issue of gender identity that's the issue here. It's the issue of whatever in the world toxic masculinity is supposed to be. And you can't even define it. I mean, if, if people are concerned about 
aggression and violence. Well, as I said already, the rates of violent crime in the U.S. have fallen by 50% in the last 25 years. We're doing unbelievably well on that front. The, the streets are safer than they have been ever. Uh, as, that's a historical fact, and they're getting safer all the time. So where's the crisis? And why in the world would we turn the education of our children over to um, idiot ideologues? I mean, even the, even the academi academics are waking up to this. There was a, an article in the, higher, in the Chronicle of Higher Education just two weeks ago excoriating the faculties of education for their appalling standards and their absolute ideological possession. And this idea that we should address toxic masculinity yeah. from K to 12 is just an extension of that. Well, we put up with it because we're passive and weak. And I wish we weren't. Thank you for reminding us of that. Professor, thank you. You bet. Very good talking with you. We'll be, we'll, thanks. We'll be right back.